I'd like you to listen to me this morning with an open heart. Um, I want to stretch you a little bit this morning. Uh, I want to say right up front that you may not agree with everything I say this morning. If you do, that's okay. That's cool. I, I get that. Uh, do me a favor, though. See me afterwards uh, and talk to me about it. But, but I, I'm going to say some things this morning that might, might stretch you a little bit because uh, we're talking about church growth. Church growth, lost souls. It, it, I was saying to somebody this morning, church growth, growth is always on my mind and heavy on my heart. And so let me start by reading a poll by the Gallup people, the most respected people. And it's, it's about, they call it the decline in church membership. In 1992, <clears throat> 70% of Americans claimed to be regular attendees of a house of worship, a church. Today, 27 years later, that number has dropped to 55%. That's staggering in my mind. And, and that's people that are attending a church. And when, when you look at core membership, there are church organizations, not Gallup, the church organizations that do studies. And they have found that the average core member of a church, so you know who you are, core member. And by the way, again, welcome to all the visitors this morning. I know, uh, Matthew, welcome. We love visitors, so you are welcome here. But to the core members, the average core member attends church 2.1 times a month. 2.1 times. Church growth. Church growth should be always in our prayers. And we all should be in the business of saving souls. And I, 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 over two years ago, and I can't believe it was over two years ago, um, the first message I gave as the pastor of this church, I asked this question, and I'm going to ask the same question this morning. Same question I asked in my first message. Are we, Spirit of God, this is for Spirit of God, are we a church that is willing to do whatever it takes to save the lost? Whatever it takes. Are you willing to change things that we used to do uh, so that the lost can come here? Are we willing to, to press in? Are we willing to look forward and not backwards? Are we willing to do whatever it takes to save the lost? The first church in Acts, famous church, Acts 2, read about it, famous. They grew every day, the Bible said. Do you ever wonder why they grew so quickly? Quickly, I, 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 here's, my, here's my thought. I believe that that first church in Acts, Acts 2, right after Jesus went to heaven, right after the Holy Spirit came, I believe they grew so quickly because they hadn't yet become a religion. I believe they grew so quickly because they didn't become the first church of Acts. They hadn't become a denomination yet. All they did was point people to Jesus. And they grew. They hadn't yet become religious. You know what happens when we become religious? We become like the older brother in the prodigal story. <laughs> we are stuck on that story. John Russell, Gary Zaleski, myself, we're stuck there. I'm going there one more time, not for the whole uh, message this morning, but I want to go there one more time because I want to look at that religious older brother. You see, when we become like the older brother in the prodigal story, we become, you know, religious. And so you, you know the story. Younger brother leaves home. Older brother isn't happy with the younger brother. Little brother, he, he took dad's money. He screws up his life. He parties in the big city. And uh, you know the story. But that older brother has a condition. His condition, I'm going to call gracism. Not racism, gracism. 
There's gracism. I deserve to be with the Father, but you don't. Oh, we got to be careful that we don't become people that have that condition, gracism. And, and gracism happens when we get religious. Let's look at the older brother. Luke 15, verse 28. The older brother was angry. He wouldn't go in to his father. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you, never once refused to do a single thing you told me to, and in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast or a party with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. Now, there's a lot of whining that we have to kind of go through in that, in that passage, but I want to point out one word up there. Prostitute. Prostitute. We all know what a prostitute is. It's a woman who sells herself. Now, i got to ask you a question this morning. How in the world did the older brother know that the younger brother was with prostitutes? We know that the younger brother leaves, the father and the older brother didn't know where he was. Right? They hadn't talked to him. There was no cell phones. He wasn't following younger brother on Facebook. I, the last time I checked, there probably wasn't a party selfie from the prodigal, you know, prodigal son selfie. How did he know that he was with prostitutes? You and I both know what's going on there. Older brother was assuming. He was assuming. Now, Let's read this verse again. Verse 29. All these years I've slaved for you, never once refused to do a single thing you told me to, and in all that time you never gave me even one young goat for a party with my friends. Older religious brother is saying, I've been slaving. I've been partyless. I'm a gracist. Well, you talk about a definition for religion? Put it up there. Here's a definition for religion. Religion is slaving and partyless. Slaving and partyless. We'll get into that a little bit later. Dad says to the older brother, everything I have is yours. I didn't know you wanted to have a party. Go get a goat right now, barbecue some veal. Invite some friends over, if you have any friends. Who wants to be around a gracist? Invite some friends over. We had to celebrate. Don't you know your brother was dead, and now he's alive. Your brother was lost, and now he's found. We had to celebrate. That's what we do. Son, don't be slaving and striving after God. Don't be partyless. That's what religious people do. Parties for the lost that come home, that's what God wants. Amen? Amen? Religious people are all about slaving and striving with God. They are partyless. And that's hypocrisy. And people see through that stuff. Another thing about hypocrisy, it's about people being something that they're really not. Are you feeling me this morning? You know, speaking of hypocrisy, dogs are hypocritical. Take a look. There's a dog who really wants to be a teddy bear. That's a Richard Branson dog. He wants to be Richard Branson. What else? Vladimir. Hypocritical dogs trying to be, oh, he wants to be a towel. Sid. <laughs> That's scary. Dogs that want to be fried chicken, take a look. The mop dog. What else? 
Oh, you know that one. Cousin It. He wants to be Cousin It. Oh, I love this one. That dog doesn't want to be a pug. He wants to be Jabba the Hutt. He's a hypocrite. Last one, I think. There we go, Chewbacca. Chewbacca. Dogs. They're hypocrites, too. We won't talk about cats this morning. I get in trouble every time I talk about cats. But anyway, I wrote this down. I wrote this down. People that aren't saved see things that should be a representation of Jesus, but what they see is a bunch of older brothers slaving and striving and partyless. And when you're slaving and you're striving, and you've got gracism, guess what? All you're worried about is following rules. You're not thinking of Jesus. You think you're thinking about Jesus, but you're thinking about the rules. And you know what's ironic about the rules that you're following? A lot of them are made up. They're not even in the Bible. Let me give you one. Now, let me say real quick. Uh, I know some of us are, were raised Catholic. I have nothing against the Catholic Church. I love the Catholic Church, but let me give you a rule. How about meatless Fridays on Lent? Catholic Church says that in order to be a good Catholic, you got to fast from meat on Fridays during Lent. It's true. Fasting is great, but nowhere in the Bible does it talk about forced fasting. It's a made-up rule. Sorry about that. Let's talk about alcohol. Maybe you drink, maybe you don't. I gotta say, we know that here more than anywhere else. I hate what alcoholism does to individuals. I hate what alcoholism does to families. We've seen families destroy because of alcoholism. It's an emotional issue. But some people have made up a rule. And they say that Christians shouldn't drink. Wait a minute. First miracle for Jesus, he made wine. He turned water into wine. Now, some people who don't like that and have made up the rule that say you shouldn't drink, they say, oh, that wasn't really wine. It was a watered-down version. It's not the wine that we have today. Oh, come on. Not only did Jesus make wine, he made some great stuff. He didn't make Boone's Farm that day, man. <laughs> Jesus made the best wine to the point that the guy who was in charge of the feast who was in charge of the wedding said, hey, Jesus, give me six cases of that. If you don't believe me that Jesus made wine and drank wine, and if you don't agree with me, I'm not going there, I don't have time this morning, but Luke 7, 33 to 34. Write it down, read it, Jesus drank wine. I don't like stupid rules because stupid rules get in the way of Jesus. I, I should say it this way. I don't like stupid man-made rules. Because God doesn't want us living life slaving and striving and partyless. Rules are important. Let me say it very quickly before nobody agrees with me. Rules are very important. Rules are there for our benefit. As a matter of fact, Rules need to be followed. There are rules that need to be followed in the Bible, a lot of them. They're there for a good reason. There are rules that need to be followed in our households. <laughs> Parents, we need to honor them. We need to follow rules. There are rules that need to be followed in our country. If you break some of those rules, you, you'll get a ticket like I did a week ago. On my way, well, no, it was two weeks ago. It was on my way, Marge to your mother's wake. <laughs> Dan and Ashley saw me pulled over by the popo, -po, right? <laughs> you did. There are rules that need to be followed where you work. 
God gave us rules. But by the time that Jesus arrived, the Pharisees had made up hundreds of rules. And Jesus just loved to mess with their minds. Luke 11, 37. As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. So he went in and took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom rules. Then the Lord said to him, you Pharisees are so, so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and wickedness, fools. Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor and you will be clean all over. Don't you love it? Jesus broke a bunch of the Pharisees' rules on purpose. He, 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 wanted to, he wanted to mess with them. He wanted to prove a point. He wanted to prove a point to them that he wasn't about all their made-up rules. You know what Jesus was about? He was about the heart of the matter. Aren't you glad? that Jesus doesn't look at you with disdain when you break some rules and screw up and fall down. Aren't you glad he looks at your heart? Can I get an amen to that? One time, Jesus is with the Pharisees and the chief, uh, the Bible calls him the chief, uh, uh, the expert in the law, and they're having this discussion, and, 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 and this, this expert in the law says to Jesus, we, we don't like it the way you talk to us. As a matter of fact, you insult us. It's true. It's in the Bible. You insult us. Oh, man. Don't you love Jesus? He didn't back down. You know what he said to this guy? He said, woe to you. You load people down with burdens that they can't carry, and then you don't lift a finger to help them. That's what Jesus said to them. And then he went on. And he said to them the same thing he says to us. This morning, he said, listen, I'm here to save people. I'm here to have a party with lost boys and girls and lost men and women. I'm here to proclaim good news to the poor. I am here to bring freedom for the prisoners. I am here to give sight to the blind. I am here to set the captive free. I am here to heal the broken and restore lives. Amen. That's what he says. That's what he says to you. That's what he says to me. And this is so important. This is where I'm heading this morning. I want to bring it home. This is what we need to see about Jesus. Jesus did most of his work out there. He didn't hang out with older brothers. He hung out with the prodigals. He hung out with the sinners. He hung out with sinners like me. And I've sinned as much, if not more, than anybody in this room. But aren't you glad that he looks at our heart and he hangs out with us. And, and I love the story in Luke about Matthew. We're just going to read this and then I'm almost done, but I love this story. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi, who's really Matthew, sitting at his tax collector's booth. He said, follow me and be my disciple. Jesus said to him, so Levi got up, Matthew got up, and left everything and followed him. So Jesus comes to this tax collector. We talked about Matthew uh, a couple months ago before Easter. The Jews hated the tax collectors for good reason. To the Jews, the tax collectors were scum of the earth. They were like mobsters. They were like drug dealers. They were bad news. But Jesus comes and he says to Matthew, and he says, follow me. This tax collector, by the way, he's a Jew and he's a tax collector. That's double jeopardy. Follow me. Matthew drops everything and comes after Jesus. Watch now. The very next group of verses after Jesus said, follow me. Later, Matthew held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. 
Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciple, Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, Oh, I love this. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come not, I have, I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Jesus is saying, you religious Pharisees, you don't get it, and I'm not going to waste any more time trying to convince you because there's a lot of people out there that get it. There's a lot of people out there that understand they need a doctor. They understand that they're sinners. And that's why I love Matthew's party. Matthew's party to me is like the modern day bar. It's filled with prodigals. It's filled with sinners. Any, anybody been in the bar? Are you with me this morning? That's, what, that's who's in the bar. It's, it's the people that know they're sick, know they need a doctor. And, and a guy walks into a bar, huh, and his name is Jesus. Oh, the Pharisees knew that those people needed God. They knew that they should be in that bar helping those people find God. But the Pharisees were too busy striving for God and slaving and being partyless. Oh, we got to be careful that we're not like the Pharisees. But this guy, Matthew, are, are you with me this morning? This guy, Matthew, he just became a Christ follower. Jesus just said, follow me. And what does Matthew do? do? He has a party. He calls all his buddies. He calls the tax collectors. He calls all the prodigals. And they all gather in his house. And he says, we need to have a party. You need to meet Jesus. You need to meet this Jesus who saved my life. And that's what evangelism is. That's how the church of America is going to grow. That's how this church is going to grow. Because evangelism... Evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. But the problem we have sometimes, church, is the longer we're Christians, the less we hang out with those out there, and the more we just huddle up in here with our best friends. Now, I'm speaking to the Spirit of God for a second. I love this church. I don't think there's a church around that reaches out to the highways and byways more than this church, right? We do. We do. But we got to look in the mirror, church. We have to look in the mirror also. And so here's my question this morning. How do we get the people out there in here? This is where I want to bring it home. How do we get them out there from out there in here? By the way, I'm not talking about membership. I could care less about membership. I'm talking about let's start with getting them out there in here so when they come in here, they hear the grace of God. They feel the love of God. They know they're not going to be judged. Let's start there. What do we think, that people are just going to fall from the sky and come in here? Oh, well, there's going to be a big revival someday. And they'll, Okay, well, hope isn't a strategy, friends. Good to hope. I hope there's a revival like no other revival. But, but it, it, it takes work. I'm going to give you some quick suggestions on how we get them out there and here. They are so practical, you won't believe it. Here we go. Let's start here. Go to a restaurant. Find a restaurant that you like and keep going to that restaurant and be a good example to the people in that restaurant and get to know the servers in that restaurant. Diane Novotny is here this morning. She's one of the greatest evangelists that I know. And Diane and several other friends from this church have been doing just that. They've been going to a place called Bottoms Up for a long time. And they have gotten to know the people there. They've gotten to know the owners there. For Pete's sake, there's a drink named after Diane over there. But Diane and several people 
have been going to bottoms up, set an example to the point that the owners literally, some nights they have bingo nights, and the owners give the proceeds to restoration ministries. That's evangelism. We need to do the same thing. Go to a restaurant, get to know the servers, be good examples, be good tippers. Don't get cheap on them. Be good tippers, and then, here we go, when the time is right, invite them to church. Go to a health club, get to know your trainer, get to know the people that you sweat with. And then when the time is right, invite them to church. Community involvement, get to know, pretty practical here, get to know the parents of the kids, of the kids that are in your kids' schools. Get to know the parents of the kids' sports teams that they're on. Get to know them. And then when the time is right, invite them to church. How about your neighbors? Do you know your neighbors? I'm weak here. Do you know your neighbors? Do you know your neighbors' names? Get involved in their lives. Have a barbecue. Get to know them. And when the time is right, what? Invite them to church. Listen, friends, I'm almost done. It takes courage to share your faith. It takes courage. But if we don't tell them, how will they know? If we don't let them know, who's going to let them know? Are we willing to do whatever it takes to reach the lost? Sinners like me and sinners like you, all of us have been invited to a banquet talked about in Revelation. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. You've heard about that, right? It's the place where those whose names are written in the book of life, meaning those that are saved, fancy way to say it, those that have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, someday we're going to be at a big banquet for the Lamb of God, the one who died for you, who died for us. We've all been invited. But some say, I'm too busy. Some say, I don't care. Some say, I don't believe. Some say, I've got plenty of time to make that decision. Some say, oh, I was judged there. I don't want to be there. OK. But I got an idea. First of all, don't miss that banquet. Nobody here this morning, please don't leave here unless you talk to somebody about Jesus if you don't know him. Don't leave. Don't miss the banquet. But here's my other thought. Invite somebody with you to go to that banquet. As a matter of fact, let's take it a step further. Why don't you, after you leave here, phone heaven and say, I'd like a table for eight. I don't want to attend that banquet alone. I don't want to eat alone. How about we take some people with us so we can share this wonderful banquet together? We need to repent from gracism. We need to embrace grace. And once we repent from gracism, then we can share his grace to a dying, lost world. Lord Jesus, help us. Help us. Oh, Lord, I, I hope that this wonderful church, these wonderful people heard my heart this morning. I hope that I didn't come off harsher or anything like that, Lord. I, I hope that, I hope they heard my heart. Lord, you know my heart, and I fall so short when it comes to every single thing that I was talking about today. Oh, God, help me to be somebody who has a table for eight. Shoot, Lord, I'd like to have a couple tables. 
Lord, we're at a really interesting point of our church's life. You've been doing new things, great things. You're doing it again. It's phenomenal, Lord. This is a grace-filled place. I so appreciate every person in this church. This church is just loved and served uh, for 40 years, and now we're continuing that. But Lord, I, I don't know. There's got to be more. Lord, help us to get a burden for the lost. Lord, help us to, to, to commit to praying for this. Help us to have the courage to share our faith. Help us, Lord Jesus.